welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have Anders Jones, co-founder and CEO of Facet. Facet is a company that looks to bring a, let's call it evolved version of financial planning to the masses, and specifically under service markets that are typically overlooked by the industry in general. And with that, here's my interview with Anders. Anders, thanks for taking the time today. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. So Anders Jones of Facet, tell us about Facet. Yeah. So we are a direct-to-consumer fintech company. And basically, we believe that there is a whole new model of financial planning that makes it both more accessible and also just better. So we're a subscription-based uh, financial planning. Finds pays an annual subscription fee, not an asset-based fee or any kind of commissions on products. And we look at a much... We, we take a much broader definition of financial planning uh, beyond what is sort of like the industry norm of just managing money and, and saving for retirement. And, you know, we think that the combination of those two things really allows us to, to work with a very different market uh, and give people the help that they need to live a better life today, not just down the road in, in retirement. Excellent. So let's jump into the history. What, uh, yeah. what was the origin of Facet? Yeah, so we started the company officially in 2016, but we spent a lot of time really understanding the market. And, you know, for context, I don't come from the financial services world. I'm a, I come from the tech world. But in, you know, in 2014 and 2015, spent a lot of time really trying to understand what was going on in fintech and wealth management. I mean, this was right around the time when like the wealth fronts, the betterments of personal capitals of the world were raising a ton of venture capital and a lot of mind share from both mainstream press and also industry press. And so, you know, we really sort of asked ourselves like, okay, wh what is the shift that's happening and how can we bring technology to bear to build a sort of the next generation of, of financial planning. And I think the big aha moment for us was in 2015 when the DOL fiduciary rule didn't pass. And the industry pushback around that was, well, if you are going to ask advisors to act in the best interest of their clients, advisors or, or there's about 8 million households that are going to lose their advisor because the advisor can't afford to do that and service them at the same time. Yeah, that's what, just the, like, that's what the broker dealers are saying. Meanwhile, the RA market's like, excuse me? But yeah. yeah, yeah, but it was, but it was a, it was a big enough, like, sort of like, what the hell moment that it was like, okay, there's a real opportunity here to build a fiduciary and much lower cost offering and launch that. And so that was sort of the initial premise, which is we can, we can use technology to lower the cost of advice, really focusing around advisor efficiency and increasing the number of clients per advisor and getting the cost savings that way, instead of just trying to think about how do you increase revenue by charging more on assets or gathering more assets or, or whatever it is, which I think is kind of the, the standard way of, of doing things. And then the other big thing for us was, okay, the AUM-based business model for retail clients does not make sense. It does not align the cost that you're paying with the value that you're receiving, right? You're paying someone for financial advice, not for beating the market. And, and if someone says, I can beat the market, you should probably run the other way. And so we said, okay, this is actually a professional service. It should be paid for as a professional service. So we did a so so we we did a subscription based approach instead of an asset based approach. So when you combine those two things, all of a sudden you're now actually opening up. You're, you're building a model that that allows people who don't have hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that an advisor can manage to still work with us because we're not relying on them on their assets to to make our money, and we're we're offering it in a much more affordable way so that so that someone with a couple hundred thousand dollars, is, it actually makes a lot of sense for. And then, you know, as time has gone on, and, and again, this is 2016, and we're now, you know, seven years into it, we work with 14,000 plus households. By the way, 80% of them have never worked with a financial advisor before, which I think is actually the, the coolest stat of the whole company, because it shows that our regional thesis, that there's an underserved market there is now really, uh, is, is, is really showing up at scale. But as we sort of gone on and spent a lot of time with our, our clients, we actually, we call them members, but with our members, what we realized is that the things that people want to talk to us about are very different than the things that like get advertised on TV about the importance of financial planning. Like the number one thing that we helped our member our members with last year was was having a baby and like the actual costs of having a child. I don't have kids, so I haven't gone through this, but my understanding is like the actual process is quite expensive. And so like we had, I don't know, probably 20 people call their advise their facet advisor from the delivery room, which I think like be hard pressed to find that at, at many other big financial advisor, financial services companies. So, anyways, that that I think kind of goes to show that like financial planning, when done well, 
looks at everything in your life that money touches, not just what's your money doing and what's it going to be doing in 40 years. Uh, so much to unpack there. All right. Let's let's go through <laughs> a bunch of stuff. All right. I'm going to start on your yeah. lap. Right. And your last point, I think, is I mean, I, I, yeah, what you said, I thought to myself, you're right. Why the focus on retirement? And it's simple because, you know, by the time people have built up enough wealth to actually be serviced by the conventional systems, then frankly, it's usually retirement is the big goal. They're probably not early career with the early kids. I mean, there are exceptions. But in general, right, the business has largely followed the boomer generation through through its 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 flow. So yeah, not surprising. But I will I have wonder- a more cynical view. I have a more cynical view of that, by the way. All right, fair enough. Well, the business makes money on asset management, right? Yeah. And so the more money that you can manage, like the more money you're going to make. And so by saying, hey, let's sol- let's solve for this long term goal. Like yeah. then you're just basically guaranteeing yourself an increasing income stream as time yeah. goes on. Look, but, I will I yeah. will give you all day that there are incentive misalignments in in the yeah. business model, and I will say that frankly, there's incentive misalignments in almost any business model. There's no purely right business model. Sure. I think um, at the end of the day, there's nothing. It does not you know using an AUM base does not prevent an advisor from doing the right thing at all times. It does not. However, it doesn't necessarily incentivize the right thing at all times, which is the problem. So. Fully, fully with you on that base. The the D, the DOL thing, I, I laugh every time because you know I I seen we didn't have the same debate in my country, but we had uh, other ones where again, oh, you want to change this thing that's highly lucrative for us? Then frankly, it's going to result in all these people being left out in the street searching for advice as if they're zombies looking for brains because we can't possibly service them. And I'm saying every time I hear this argument, it's the same old reply to me. It's like, so you're, what you're basically saying is that your legacy business model is not designed to meet the needs of people. And that, yeah. oh no, regulation needs to stay in a certain state so that instead of doing what's best for them, you know, and involving the industry in the best interest of the client, no, no, we need to let you continue to basically not evolve and not find ways to meet this. Like it is not the, it is not, it is, if we're going to blame, if, you know, if those companies were basically saying, well, we can't do this, all these people are going to be lost. That's a problem with your business model, not a problem with the fact that you're do the right thing. And, and that I think was like the big insight for us, like the non-obvious insight was around, this is actually an admission that the cost structure is too high, right? That no one has innovated yeah. around how do you actually reduce the cost to serve instead of instead of just figuring out how to charge more. Yeah, yeah, and and then it's an it's a it's a play at industry capture to basically try to keep regulation in a certain state so that you're not getting rid of that. And I again in my country different problems, but in more often than in background we got rid of this embedded compensation model that paid people up front a substantial amount. And you know the argument was oh it can't be done. My response was always what else have you tried? And the answer was no. Are you are you in Canada? I am in Canada. Okay, I figured. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean I'm, that said, I'm also US CFP, so I'm very familiar with the arguments on both sides of the border. It's just funny to see how how they are so always the same. It doesn't matter what change it is, it's always the same argument with that way, and always the same attack factor. Have you tried anything else? Well, no. Yeah, maybe yeah, you exactly. should before you say it's not yeah. doable. Right. Yeah. All right. So okay. Talk to me about how you do this, okay? I mean, the subscription model, I'm a big fan because I do, I do consider it to be massively market expanding because now you're talking about people with decent income, not necessarily decent net worth, right? So yep. so great. Now, and then again, you know, as for the over-focus on retirement, I agree. I think that there is infinitely more that can be done and should be done and is done by many planners for people at different life stages in every interaction. I think, frankly, whatever we can do to get people the planners in front of people doing that kind of good work is only going to benefit all society. So talk to me about how you enable that. Yeah. So I think um, there's a few components here. So number one is we took a step back and we basically said, okay, for our sort of like, first of all, who's, who's our ideal client or who's our ideal member. And we basically came up with, with sort of two core ICPs. One is what I described as like young families. So anyone kind of late twenties to early forties who are kind of, I always laugh and say, it's like, these are people who are like starting to like adults, right? Like they're like figuring out. They're adulting. Yeah, adulting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and they want some help. Uh, and the other is is pre-retirees. So um, people who are focused on like, okay, in the next five to 10 years, like I'm going to lose my steady income. How do I, you know, how do I optimize? And, you know, like we help people sort of cross the spectrum, but if I just sort of pick two, those, those would be our two. And then we took a step back and we said, you know, let's identify the sort of life milestones that are consistent across uh, all of, you know, across all of the folks that fall in each of those segments. And so we, we came up with basically 44 different life milestones that everyone goes through at least some of them, right? Buying a house, having a kid, getting married, you know, starting a small business. Like, like there's, you know, it's not, not everyone for every, not everything for everyone, but like there's, there's enough overlap that yeah, covers. But, but, basically you know, everything. No one's fully unique. You're just a combination of random things that basically you can, not random things, but things that other people experience. So you can plan for all of those and give people what they need. 
Yeah, I sort of think about it's like the building blocks, like behind the scenes that when you arrange them in a certain way, you get a unique outcome, but the building blocks are all the same. Yes. And so, so so then we basically sort of formed a, a philosophy around each one. So like, as an example, like we're believers that you should always have a six month emergency fund, right? And that like, you should probably do that before you start investing money in a brokerage account, right? Other advisors will have different opinions of that. There's certainly some some nuance there, or, or it's, it's certainly a bit subjective. But we just sort of said, look, for our sort of target market, like let's let's build out sort of like the right order of operations, the right priorities, and build this sort of facet philosophy around it. Um, and we have like a, a council of advisors on our team that sort of look at each topic frequently to make sure that we're thinking about the right way. And then we said, okay, so so now we've basically built a customer journey, right? So someone signs with us, and then they kind of go through. Like a twenty, you know, I want to start a family, and here are the three big expenditures that are on my mind. Okay, cool. Have you also thought about estate planning and risk management? Because now all of a sudden you have a totally different profile, given that you're about to have a kid. So that sort of combination of things sort of makes up the the set of things that we we do for people. And then you know, once you have sort of like one process sort of under the that that underpins it all, then you just go through and you build technology that automates each step of the process where you can automate it. So. Our sort of philosophy around how we've built our tech is an advisor's highest and best use is time spent in front of the client, hmm. not in actually doing the financial planning, because that's a very automatable thing that you can do actually higher quality outcomes with technology that an advisor checks versus vice versa. So that's kind of how we did it. So the some of the metrics that we look at are, you know, member per planner ratio. So the industry average is like 75. Ours, when they're fully ramped, work with between like 250 and 300. Uh, so we have like, a, you know, we, we have much yeah. more efficiency there. And that's where a big part of the cost savings yeah. comes in. But I would say yeah. that there is a good and bad there, right? Like absolutely helping more people. Great. But I will say there's a there's an intimacy level that you will not have at that scale. But that said, I mean, like, that's not necessarily I mean, like, should you be expecting that at the levels of the market we're talking about? And the answer is no, right? Like, yeah. you can go to a nice hotel, but you're not necessarily at the four seasons, right? Like, it's just it's 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 fine. I think there's also a big mismatch in the industry in terms of what people think or what advisors think clients value versus, versus what clients actually value. This is true. Like number of meetings per year, right? Like, and by the way, we made this mistake where we said, okay, we have to think about this in terms of like, if someone's not getting between four and six meetings every year, they're not going to see the value. Actually, yeah. turns out that that's more of a pain in the ass for the client than it is than it is beneficial. What's m- much more important is response time. So it's like, hey, I'm like, I'm actually going through this right now. I'm buying a house. And like, I was like, wait, I have a question about, a mortgage rate, like I need to talk to my advisor in the next like 12 or 24 hours to like get, you know, before I put an offer in, right. Versus like, versus like setting a meeting two months out and then like, maybe I'm going to go to it. Maybe I'm not. So, so I think that, you know, yeah, like I hear you on the level of intimacy, but I also think that it's like, you can solve for that by understanding like what people value the most. Yeah. It's not a full disconnect. I mean, there's plenty of people who see people quarterly, but at the end of the day, they really don't speak to them. Right. So, but, yeah. um, but yeah, so continue. So numbers, automation, you know, what, uh, so, so please elaborate anything beyond that. I mean, obviously we look at, you know, client satisfaction and, and retention and things like that. I think that's, that's probably standard across the industry, but those are, those are the big ones for us. And then I'd say, you know, the, the other piece I would say is like what we describe as like activation, which is you know, advice is only as good as the action that you take on it. And so if we tell someone, Hey, this is probably the right thing to do, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to actually do it. So like, I'll go back to the estate planning example. We have an estate planning team and we have like a whole service that we, that we provide that like, it's like, Hey, you need a estate plan. We actually, we can, we can help you do that. Uh, and as time goes on, there's more and more stuff we're going to add to that. Like I would imagine tax is a big one. Insurance. We, we already sort of help with that, you know, but there's, and, and I'm certainly managing money and like, you know, getting people's accounts set up in the right way with the appropriate fee uh, structure and that sort of thing. So there's a number of sort of like additional like implementation services that are, that are part of it. And I think the vision that we're building towards is almost like a family office for the mass affluent or, you know, being a finan- that financial hub, which I think like you, you have to lead with advice to make that vision come alive. 100% because that's where everything trickles down from and being able to, I mean, it's a natural step to want to be able to provide that all internally. I mean, it also yeah. makes sense from the standpoint of, you know, when you're looking at, when you're not doing an AUM system, there's a scaling aspect that is lost in terms of client wealth. So, but if you're doing that, if you're augmenting that through sale of other services that are necessary, then frankly, at a fair price, then that also makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Different way, we do manage money. We we manage money. We include it as part of the subscription. So we don't charge yeah. anything extra for it. 
but we have like, I don't know. I mean, on the AUM right. basis, there's a scaling that is lost there. But at the uh, end of the day, like yeah. you're, 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 you're scaling in a different way in terms of just services offered. So that makes perfect yep. sense. Okay, yeah. good. So talk to me about what you built for this. Like, I mean, how did you facilitate all this? Like, how do we build the company? How'd you build the, the tech side of this to actually make deliver on everything you're hoping to do? Yeah, I mean, so we have, um, you know, we have an engineering and product team. It's It's basically all homegrown. We basically said, if we're going to, sort of have our own defined process, then we need to own the technology underneath it. If not, then we're just kind of another RIA that's like integrating different systems without a lot of customizable customizability. And so um so we, you know we we've kind of done the done the whole thing from scratch. We have a client side. Interestingly actually for a fintech company, we don't have a mobile app. We might try and rectify that in 2024, but it's not uh it's not something that we we built. And then we have a uh, and then we have an advisor side where that's where the, the bulk of the investment's going. And so there's a lot of like workflow automation, like data capture and, and analysis. Um, we have some, what I've described as like light AI that's getting like heavier and heavier by the day. But, you know, so does everyone and their dog right now. So, you know, I don't want to oversell mm-hmm. that too much. But yeah, I mean, I think, we, you know, we've got, uh, we've got a pretty robust um, platform that, you know, we've, we've built up over the years. Good stuff. All right. So, all right. Talk to me about how basically you're obtaining clients. I mean, this is the direct to consumer is not a small lift, right? Usually it's a significant marketing spend to get there. So we, um, yeah, we, we have a, a sort of like digital demand generation machine. Like we're not, um, you know, doing the, doing the, first of all, our, our entire service is, is virtual, right? So we don't actually meet with members in person. So, you know, our, our acquisition channels kind of reflect that. So, you know, look, our biggest competitor is DIY, right? Mm. So that really informs sort of how we think about our, our go-to-market. So we take a very sort of like content forward and sort of educational approach. Like if you go on our website, facet.com slash learn, each one of those 44 life milestones, we have a whole bunch of content around each one of them that sort of like, that, that puts it in the context of financial planning and, and financial advice. And then, you know, generally we basically just meet people where they are in terms of, uh, in terms of like they're going through each one of these these phases and and you know we we're the sort of like voice of financial planning as they go through it so that's generally how we how we think about it hmm, fair enough so what is the ongoing like the onboarding experience look like when coming on board with you guys yeah so we have um we actually have a separate team that onboards folks so one sort of key part of our model is we don't ask our advisors to sell you know we basically think their highest and best use is providing amazing service to to our members so we have a separate membership team that, that onboards folks. It's usually like a two-call process to understand who are you, what are you looking to get out of, out of financial advice, and then we can explain what we can do for you with FACET. And so, you know, that, that's kind of the, the initial thing. And then there's, a, there's sort of a digital onboarding flow that we've put together that's basically all about data capture, right? I think if you ask any traditional advisor, one of the veins of their existence is around like entering client data when they first get, when they yeah. first onboard someone. So we've automated the vast majority of that. And we're really, you know, we, we kind of like do away with all that, all that time. And then we jump right into the, into the planning process. So, you know, we, we'll, we'll spend some initial time, like, you know, really understanding who the person is and what they're trying to, to accomplish. And then, you know, come up with, them, with some scenarios and recommendations around like, you know, these are the, these are the steps that you should take to, to sort of optimize for, for what it is, whatever it is you're optimizing for. Excellent. All right. So then that's, that's what they're doing. So from the planner's standpoint, right? Like, are they getting randomly assigned these people? Are they being routed to them? And then what is that first, you know, what are they getting before the first interaction with the client? Yeah. So the, the planners are assigned, uh, I would say there's some, some light personalization there. Certainly we try and match time zones. That's a big one. And then if there are sort of special requests around, like, you know, someone might be more comfortable with a female planner or someone might be going through a divorce and we have a couple of folks who are really good at sort of the planning aspects of divorce, you know, we'll, we'll try and, and sort of match that way. But also like we've really tried to create one consistent experience across facets. So um, I won't say it doesn't matter who your planner is, but like we, we try and make it so that, you know, you're, you're a client of facet above and beyond or, or beyond all else. Sorry. What was the second part of your question? Like okay, so yeah, once they're actually meeting with that client, what's that first interaction look like? What are the what is the, what's yeah, the yeah. outcome that you're hoping to accomplish in that first one? Yeah, so you know the good news about having the sort of having a, a separated sales process is that we you know we gather a bunch of data ahead of time and then we build a profile of who that person is before they ever talk to the talk to the planner. So the planner is like sitting down first time 
and getting the, you know, they, they sort of already know who this, who this person is. So it's a much warmer intro conversation than you would, than you would typically get. And that is actually kind of where some of the AI comes in. It's pretty cool. Like we basically um, go through all the call transcripts and uh, of all the different touch points that we have with someone. And we use that to kind of build the, build the member profile. So like that's, it's a, it's a new thing that we've just started doing the last few months. And it's a, it's, it's pretty cool technology. Um, But then, you know, then it's like, okay, let's get to know you and sort of understand more. Typically we tend to focus more on like the emotional aspects. Like we always kind of laugh and say, our planners are really like therapists with calculators. And so like really understanding people's why and like what it is that they're, that they're trying to accomplish. I mean, to a certain extent, like you can really express your identity with, how you choose to spend your money or not spend it. And Mm. so like, we really try and get to the root of that, of like, who is this person trying to be and how can we help get them there? So again, it's, it's certainly not a one size fits all and each, each conversation is different, but I think our sort of philosophy is like, when we're first getting to know someone, let's really hone in on the why first, and then we'll figure out the the what and the how. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. (laughs) besides quoting the Simon Sinek book, at yeah. the end of the day, the, the underlying why is what drives all of it after that. Yeah, yeah. I think that gets lost a lot wow. in sort of how it's done today. It, it's, it's, the, it's the classic problem of if you get paid, the shortest route on something, the shortest route is basically the thing that is incentivizing you, right? So, um, yeah. you know, you create a culture that based or create a system that you get paid based off of product or whatever else it is. No surprise that people hone in on the shortest route, the compensation. Doesn't mean that all people do that, but it just means that the incentive is misaligned with the actual, <laughs> the actual piece. I mean, in a world where we could actually measure determinism, the real metric would be, you know, here's the client's actual disputed, uh, you know, life path. Assuming you actually don't, you don't get involved. Here's the delta. If we fully, uh, here's the delta. Some form of compensation or slice of that would be acceptable. But again, we do not live in a fully deterministic world, so <laughs> yeah, can't quite do that. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, I, you know, I'm going to ask you what your why is, but I'm already, I can already tell the answer is an annuity. Well, I mean, yeah, what you want to say, it's, I speak about this all the time. The, the highest, best version of a financial planner is someone who helps their clients self-actualize the best version of their lives. And if, that's, yeah, if you, if you start with that purpose and goal, the reality is, is that regardless of your met, regardless of your compensation model, I shouldn't say regardless, regardless of, mo- of, of most compensation models, you should be able to, with the best intent, get provide value around that because that's what you're trying to do. However, it, and you have to, tr- but there's also this mindset of you have to trust the fact that basically everything you're, you're, you're going to get rewarded along the way for all those things. Mm-hmm. That is partially how you design your business, but is it the most effective direct model for doing it? No, it's, it's an imperfect model in an imperfect world. Good. Yeah. So talk to me about, you know, how the demographics of your client base differ from say a conventional advisory shop. I mean, I'll, I'll give you uh, some averages, which never tell the true story, but I think are pretty telling here is um, our average client age is 45. And, you know, I think the average advisor age is like 65 or 67. And, you know, like I said, our, our, our sort of two ICPs are you know, young families and pre-retirees. But when you average those two together, like you get a much, much younger age. So I think that we're, we're very focused on sort of the next generation. And then, you know, from a wealth standpoint, we, so like, you know, for context, our minimum fee is $2,400 a year. So mm-hmm. we're not all Super things accessible. All I mean, $200 yeah. a month, right? Yeah. 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 But there is a level at which it doesn't make sense, right? So we oh. kind of cut, cut it off at 150000 of assets plus income. So any combination of that, can, it, it work, works for us. And so, you know, look, we, you know, we have a lot of people who, as, as you already described, right? Like, you know, good income, not a ton of assets, but we're sort of on the path. And then, you know, we're, we're sort of like exactly the right, um, you know, exactly the right, the right fit for them at, at that point. What, I, what we found interestingly is, you know, it's funny when I, whenever I talk to advisors, they're always terrified of their clients graduating and like getting too big for them. And yeah, but, you know what? I, well, it doesn't yeah. happen, but sometimes it should like, like, let's be realistic, right? We see this in every, I see this in every profession, whether it be an advisor, an accountant, or a lawyer, sometimes that client gets their life gets too complicated and too advanced yeah. for your skill set. You know what? If they graduate, great for them and accept that you help get them there. But at the end of the day, the best thing you can do at some point is basically say, I'm, I'm actually out. I'm out because frankly, what you need is beyond me, but I will help you find the person who's going who's gonna to help you with it. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally right. But I, th- I think what's funny, like, like I always talk to people like, oh, well, you're going to need an upmarket solution because you're going to need to like, you know, graduate these people into high net worth solution and all that. And it's like, I can count on both hands the number of folks that we've lost. And it's- I know what solutions. Are they talking products? Yeah, no. Yeah, so they, like you're just- 
oh sorry point point of contention here now the you know i'll go yeah. with buffett's entire frame of mind on the like on this and basically saying yeah please you're just trying to sell something the, the exclusivity and the and the marketing spin of it all when in actuality all you need is index funds really but the reality is is that the reason people it's amazing the industry tells wealthier people they need this stuff and then maybe some of the wealthy people then think they need this stuff because they read this stuff and then they go looking for it it's this ridiculous like we're creating this paradigm to make, pe- make people believe they need it when it's absolutely not necessary, but continue. Yeah. <laughs> what I was going to say is where, where, we, where we sort of run up against the, the higher end of complexities around actually more like tax and estate stuff, less mm, so as management. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that starts kicking in around 10 million bucks, which like, again, you know, folks that don't, fo- most folks that come to us, either they, they don't get there or, or you know, they're, they're a long ways away from getting there. So we have, we have plenty, to, plenty to do on that. Yep. All right. So, so uh, tell me, how many clients are you servicing currently? Can you tell me? Right now, about 14,000. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a scale that's uh, pretty hard to top in, in the plan- with the planning centric model. Fantastic. So, well done. All right. So, before we end up, and by the way, great work. Glad you exist because, frankly, you know, there's a segment of the market that is just not going to be serviced and targeted. And that having you guys as an option is just a win across the board, quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm also going to make a point about what you said about, you know, certain it's not going to work for everybody. This is, you know, Kits has famously published a, a famously, famously amongst our industry, published an article <laughs> on, on uh, you know, clients that are accessibility and different fee models. And yeah, a certain segment can be served by AUM, a certain segment can be serviced by, by retainer-based and monthly retainer-based models, but the uh, subscription. But there is always going to be a segment that just does not have the income or the assets for it, right? I mean, short of pro bono, it's a really tough nut to crack. And even if we, maybe one day guys like you can get the price point down to 100, but there'll still be people below that 100, right? It's just, yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely. Right. So I actually, like, I'm a big optimist on this. And, you know, it's funny, in the same conversation where people are like, oh, you need a high net worth solution. It's like, no, actually, what we're doing right now is building Uber Black. And what's coming next is Uber X. Good. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that in the next year, we'll have something out there that's like $1,000 a year, $1,500 yeah. a year, whatever it is, because uh, the technology just keeps getting better, right? And, yeah. and the AI thing, it's very overhyped right now, but it is very, it, it's also very real. Yeah. And like our ability to basically like really leverage AI to deliver an increasing amount of the financial planning, increasing amount of the, the core planning experience is just getting better and better over time. And so I think that that's, that's what a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollar uh, offering looks like. And you're right. Look, there's always going to be a segment of people that are just impossible to serve, yeah. but that, but our addressable market's going to get bigger as time goes on. Well, and, and frankly, you know, you're, you're in the blue ocean of zones, right? Like yeah. these are the people who have no good options, quite honestly, more often than not, it's going to local corner shop bank or whatever else it is and get completely hosed by people who are barely trained, you know, sort of say, and it's, it's, it's a known fact, quite honestly. So, so yeah, so well done. All right. So before we end, there's three questions I ask everybody on a positive note. First one I have for you is if you had one wish for something you can change in your company or the industry as a whole, what would it be? Uh, I wish that for the industry as a whole, like I, I honestly believe that uh, subscription fees are, are the the path of the future, and so I think that like like there would be such an unbelievable benefit to the economy if that was the default way of of charging for financial advice. Like I think that like financial literacy, like like all like everything that financial planning can do would be so much more accessible if it was like across the, the industry. Obviously, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because like we're, that's one of our big differentiators. But I think that like in the long run, the world's going to go that way. If we could change that now, I think yeah. like the, the world would be such a better place. Yeah, I think it'll end up probably some, I think the AUM is going to be sticky because it's easily handled and it's conventional people are used to it. But do I think that, you know, we're probably moving to a world where there'll be some sort of base level minimum fee subscription and then based in at least a reduced if not free, but reduced AUM. Absolutely. I think that is, that, that yeah. makes sense. Now, again, anyone who's threatened by that isn't thinking big enough because quite frankly, it doesn't mean that these people servicing high network clients are not going to be able to make similar money. This means that their fee is going to be different. <laughs> their structure is going to be different yeah. and a little bit more egalitarian in that regard. So, so it makes perfect sense. So, all right, that's the first one. The second question I have for you is what's been the biggest challenge in the company where it is today? Honestly, and, and my answer to this would have been different a couple of years ago, but we're totally virtual. And uh, if I could snap my fingers and have everyone back in an office, I would do it in a, in a heartbeat. And we were, we were primarily virtual before COVID. We were about 50-50. Um, but just like trying to, especially the, some of the more creative things like 
building product and and designing things and like building you know marketing strategy like it's just so much easier to do in person and uh and we we really i think like like at this point we've got 250 people in 42 different states so it's like kind of hard to you know the genie's out of the bottle right but yeah that that would be kind of number one good stuff and the last question i have for you is what uh what keeps you getting out of bed every morning excited to keep up fighting the good fight i think there's two two things one is like our mission like we we didn't really talk about this but our culture at facet is like so incredibly mission oriented like everyone has a specific story around why they think financial planning and financial advice needs to change. And like, we have a channel in Slack called Dreams Made Possible, where every time one of our members achieves a goal, the advisor posts about it in Slack. Like that's the, that's the good stuff right there, right? Yeah. That's like why we're all in this, right. which, is, uh, which is, is really cool. So that, that's number one. And number two is I just have an incredible team. You know, my, my executive team and, uh, and, and, you know, the, the folks across the company, we have a ton of fun together. And like, it's hard work, like building a business is hard, right? Being, being an entrepreneur and building something from scratch, as you know, is it's, it's difficult, but if you're doing with people you really like, and that like you hang out with outside of work, like that, that, uh, that's a great way to spend your time. Excellent. Well, Anders, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your service. Quite honestly, I think you're doing, doing great work, quite honestly. Oh, I appreciate it. So that was this week's episode of FinTech Impact. Hope you enjoyed that. And if as always, if you enjoyed that podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca.